right, let's move this. It's Sunday morning about 9 a.m. And uh, the church, church is full. There's still room at the back to sort of cram yourself in there. And that's good. That's good. Great. Perfect. Okay, let's dive right in. Uh, I'm back. Another stream. There's a few uh, days gap there. It's my bad. I try to keep it regular. Today. Today and today and today. That's a Shakespeare quote for you. Today we're gonna we're gonna do something simple. In fact, you could even argue that we're gonna do something repetitive, which uh, I mean, there's only so many things we can do, but at the same time, we always try to do something new. Let's take a look at this bad boy. Damn, that's a good module. I didn't really get this module, and my buddy Adam once you know, mentioned about what a digitizer or what a bit crusher can do and the kind of sounds it can make. And I was like, oh, I get it. That's that sound that I was hearing on that stuff. So, yeah, uh, I want to investigate this little module today, and I want to, especially because I do think it's something we can find all over the world in terms of... Uh, the systems that uh, this could be founded. Um, the concept of the digitizer is part of... Uh, it's funny because it's one of those things that like wasn't even an effect and is now an effect. So let's think about it that way. Yeah. So like back in the day, if you had a sampler, your sampler might sample at 8 bits, 10 bits, 12 bits. That was pretty good in the late 80s and a lot of classic hip-hop tracks were made on uh gear such as uh like the dmx drum machine which is a sampler and uh, early versions of the mpc uh early akai samplers like the s1000 they all had lower bit rates than a cd which if you aren't aware is 16 bits 16 bits could be seen as well, the CD established it as, like, the standard of, like, being good. And anything below 16 bits was seen as bad. Now, that said, uh, there's a lot of digital synths out there that never had 16-bit, or in their earliest and most famous incarnations did not have 16-bit. A good example is the DX7. I believe the DX7's first version had 14-bit digital-to-audio converters. So, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, once CD came along in my lifetime and said, lo and behold, 16 bits is what you must sample at, and if you sample lower than that, you are, you are grungy, you are uh, lo-fi, you are crunchy. And uh, that actually made people realize, like, yeah, okay, that's good. We want to be lo-fi, we want to be crunchy. So the concept of reducing a bit rate, or as we see here, a sample rate, uh, became more well known. I mentioned that the CD was 16-bit. It was also 44,100 kilohertz sample rate, which is uh, a little bit, looks like less than what we can get up to here. And here we can't go above 12. The lowest number is 12. So I believe the uh, Nord Micromodular internally is normally operating at 24-bit uh, uh, sound creation. And this sample rate is very high and clean. So uh, mostly sample rate affects the high end of sounds rather than the low end uh, for various reasons that I'm not going to go into here. So it has been, if you have a lower sample rate, some people may say they can hear what's called aliasing or a kind of ringing tone in the, in the high end uh, sounds, like cymbal sounds or pianos played in the upper octave, things like that. But like I said, uh, once 
once CD had established what was good, people wanted to be bad, for, for lack of a better term. Or at least they wanted to have the option to reduce their bit rate and sample rate and I guess let the listener decide whether that sounded good or bad. So if you out there have a, uh, a bit crusher, a bit reducer, uh, I doubt it's going to be called a digitizer like this one. There was an older version in the Nord modular called the quantizer. And this is not a quantizer as, uh, of notes, but of bits. As you can see, it can go from 12 down to, I assume, 1. Well, they didn't delete it, but they replaced that functionality here, although you can use just the quantizer if you want to, because only 0.51%, whereas a digitizer is 34 I can honestly say I almost never use the quantizer, but, and in fact, as so we'll see today, I often turn the quantizer here off. I like the full 16 bits. What I tend to use is a sample rate reduction uh, to add a sort of lo-fi quality to my tones. And uh, with, with that in mind, let's start building something musical. Today I'm going to, my plan in my mind, I want to do a couple of streams exploring the digitizer and how it sounds. My first one today, I'm going to have a couple of melodic oscillators. They're going to play a couple of melodic lines, and then we're going to reduce their sample rate. We may, for demonstration purposes, we may reduce their uh, bit rate, but in the final version, that probably won't get used, just so you know. That's not my goal anyway. I would also say that uh, doing what I'm doing here is a very go-to sound for me. This is the opposite of me taking a module that I don't know, like the Shaper, and starting from scratch. I'm very much in my comfort zone using the uh, digitizer. If anything, I overuse it, in especially in uh, Nord Modular patches. So I think that's good too. I think. It's fine for me to say, here's what I overuse, and here's what I underuse, and here's how exactly I do that. And everybody else out there will over or underuse whatever the heck they're doing, and, you know, that's, that's their issue. Uh, they can learn from my over or underuse of the digitizer as they, as they see fit. And, uh, yeah, I like I said, I think that's fine. So, uh, today at least one of my, I can tell in advance that at least one of my oscillators is going to be a square wave sound because, not that, because I'm going for a sort of what I call Game Boy sound. Um, I've been pretty obsessed with Game Boy and low bitrate music uh, since I was a kid. Uh, I didn't have a Super Nintendo, but I did have a Commodore 64, which had about, oh, three or four hundred uh, illegally copied games. And uh, the games had often amazing music. Uh, it varied anywhere from awesome to terrible. And it had many... It was a different time. The, the, the sounds that they made were very odd, and the games they designed were often very odd. For example, I remember a cartridge, as opposed to a game on a disc, which was called Ranch. And in Ranch, you could set up what looked like an animation of a, of a, you know, a ranch where there was a, a cowboy and cows and other farming related uh, stuff. And uh, then you, once you had placed all your little elements, you could hit a button that was sort of like go, and then it would animate all the little, you know, cows. The cows were giving milk or the cowboys were shooting their guns in the air or whatever, and it would play sounds along with them. But that was it. It wasn't a like a sequencer for music. It wasn't a game. You couldn't win. All you could do is place the elements on the ranch and just, you know, let them, let them move around. It was weird. But uh, but that was, you know, uh, a product of its time. People didn't really know what 
a video game was yet, or they weren't constrained by concepts of AAA games or whatever, however people mentally quantify uh, games in the modern world. So, yeah, Ranch was something where I felt like I was in control. It was almost like building, like, uh, a setup in Lego. And then once you set it to animate or to run, uh, you you realize that you had control over the sound. If you had more cows, there'd be more mooing or whatever. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty powerful effect on me. And also, I would say uh, I had a, a Game Boy, the first non-color version, and I played a hell of a lot of Final Fantasy Legend and Final Fantasy Legend 2. They both had amazing soundtracks, uh, and I really liked the sound of those. And later, I also got something called Nano Loop 1.0. I think a lot of people know Nano Loop now, but I owned it in the year 2001 when... There wasn't even a word like chip tunes. It didn't exist as a concept. So it was very, yeah, it was a very different time that I was running 4-bit FM synthesis on the on the Nano Loop 1.0 and uh, making some very crunchy sounds. So after that little history lesson, let's look at what I've set up here. And this is not going to be anything new to anybody who's been watching. we got the clock gen. And he's running uh, an event sequencer and two note sequencers so we can play melodic lines here. Then we've got uh, oscillator one is set to square wave. Uh, square waves are often used in Game Boy type or early computing music. So I chose that waveform. And then I'm going to run him into the classic LP filter. I'm going to run him into a simple envelope and then into my uh, digitizer, which I'm going to turn all the elements off for now, and then plug them into the mixer. Then we got channel two over here. Uh, let's drop him down an octave. He can be the bassier of the two. There he goes. He's in sawtooth mode, so he doesn't need the pulse width uh, modulation. Uh, oh, I said he was going to be the bass, but here I've chosen a, uh, a filter that may not work with that. So let's try this filter instead. I was going to use the bandpass filter, but it's not really ideal for a bass line. So let's just use the other one, which is not classic LP filter, but regular LP filter. And as before, I'm going to turn off the elements of the digitizer so you won't be hearing those at all in our original sounds. And uh, how about melodically? Let's see what we can do here. Um, I was listening back, and I liked one of the I liked one of the tracks I made before, "Headless Robot" or "Robo." And uh, one of the things I liked was that the bass line was at half the tempo of most of the rest of the track. So I think I'm going to do that here. Let's take the uh, let's take the clock and the reset from the standard setup, and then cut the division uh, by two, and send that here. So that probably means I won't use at least in the beginning channel two of the event sequencer, and instead I'm going to use a clocked pattern generator. So what I'm going to have is a, one of my melody lines is going to be repeating and regular and 16 step and everything we like to call normal. And the other one is going to be generative and weird and all over the darned place. Uh, let's do some of this. I'm looking for the key quantizer. There it is. Just to be logical, let's switch the positions of these things because the key quantizer goes together with the sequencer. Reduce this down to 32. This is the range. If you spread it over four octaves, you get such a wide variety of notes that they'll be high and low and everything in between and it'll be really uh, 
all over the darn place and it'll be hard to listen to. So uh, I cut the range in half, plug that into the pitch input of the second oscillator. And I'm going to take the same divided clock, the clock that was divided by two, to run my pattern generator here and send the output of that to this. There we go. That's envelope two here. You can hear the notes starting. I'm going to be cheap and take the output of that sequencer and plug it into the pattern modulator just so I can get variety in the patterns without spending a, a random LFO on it. So we've got one of the guys sounding. Let's give some notes to the other uh, the other oscillator. I'm going to give him some octaves as I like to do. pitch here, crank that up to maximum, oh I am going to need, I tried to save money or processing power on a LFO, but I'm going to need one anyway for my pulse width modulation, you know what, I always use the random one, but today I'm going to use, uh, what I want is either a triangle or a sign, a uh, sign is what came up first, good. And I want him to modulate the pulse width quite a bit, but quite slowly, just for that classic sweep. Other things may be random in this patch, but not that. And he needs some notes here as well. There we go. Okay, now we're getting started here. Still a little quiet, but... sweep the pulse width if you sweep it too much the pulse can get super thin meaning it basically fades away to nothing but what I need to do is open the filters a little bit yeah, kind of had my volumes cranked there a bit it's hard to get an exact balance between my voice and the synth here so you can still hear what I'm doing since I can see this filter has 12 and 24, I decided to set this one to 18, which is the so-called 303 filter setting. Since that first oscillator is playing the repeatable pattern, let's give him a little bit of randomness with a clocked pattern step generator. No, I mean clocked random step generator, sorry. I run him off the normal clock, not the cut in half clock, and I'm going to adjust the filter with it. There we go, now we got some classic sounds. Let's open this guy up a little bit as well. filter. It's pretty simple, but I like it. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to run this one off the half clock and send this to the other filter. are helping give me that clicky pattern type feel that I that I wanted but we still haven't gotten digital yet we still haven't gotten lo-fi yet so let's do that now so 
the default that the digitizer in Nord comes at is here at halfway. Just so you can hear it more accurately, uh, I've decided to crank it up to the beginning, to the highest level. Let's briefly talk about the difference between these two settings. If you take the quantizer, here, I'll actually let you hear it. So there's just the, the repetitive uh, melody oscillator. Let's turn on the 12-bit quantizer and start cutting the bits out. Here we go, you hear that? We're getting noisiness, buzziness in the upper frequencies. Let's go back to 12. It sounds pretty clean at 12, probably because the filter is cutting out the upper range of the thing. Well, let's just hear it. Okay, it's a bit annoying to listen to. Let's do the reduction again. So there, around eight, you can definitely hear it, right? It's almost like the quantizer is like struggling to keep up with the sound, so the fuzz kind of trails behind the notes a bit. Let's keep going down. So the distortion and artifacts are more prevalent. And now here things are getting all messed up. Sorry if that was a bit loud. So our usable range, the low end is probably maybe five bits. And the upper range, well you can, depends how open your filter is. You can go up to 12, but anything below 4 bits is going to really reduce your, your audio to nothing. I'm going to turn this off again. And we get our nice, clean, Nord Modular digital analog sound. One of the reasons that I don't uh, use a quantizer more often is because it really messes up your bass line. Uh, it messes up your bass frequencies, and if you have a lot of mud or gunk or unwanted bass frequencies, it can rob a lot of power out of your music because your speaker is trying really hard to, you know, produce those. It's using lots of electricity to try and reproduce those bass notes at like, you know, 40 hertz or 30 hertz below where the human ear can even really perceive. Because that's what its job. You send it a wave, it's going to try and reproduce it. It doesn't know that you can't hear it. And uh, I'm not a math expert, as you all know, but... Uh, yeah, I can tell you that reducing the bitrate will make your bass really muddy. So one way to solve that, if you say, okay, but I really do want a, uh, a quantized bass sound, well, you can insert a high-pass filter after the sound. So let's just hear what that would sound like. This is a fixed high-pass filter. So I'm gonna turn the quantizer on again. So you can hear, here you can get your crunch. This would allow almost all of the bass noise through. And this will cut a lot of it out. So depending what kind of system you're listening on, I mean, if you were like in a nightclub, you'd probably be able to hear it when I dialed this to the left, the gunky bass would come through. If you're listening on headphones or computer speakers, uh, the distinction may be lost on you. To be honest, even I can't hear a huge difference right now. But I'm just telling you, that's how it, that's how it works. So let's turn this back off. As I said, the one I like a lot more is sample rate. I think of this as a bit reducer, but and sometimes I even call it that erroneously. But technically, no bits are being reduced right now. We're getting the full 24 bits. Let's drag down the sample rate and see what we hear. Oh, nothing. Why? Because I turned it off. Haha. <laughs> Oops. 
So here you can already hear some. So in the upper frequencies of the sound, you're getting degradation, you're getting buzziness, you're getting a old video game quality. You're even getting sort of like gong-like notes that mix with the melody notes. The melody is still audible, but those other notes are kind of in there. If you get past the halfway mark, you'll still get interesting stuff. But this is more like ring modulated almost at this point. And if you get down here, well, you might find something very interesting. That's actually kind of nice what I'm listening to right now. That's kind of rad. But uh, I tend not to use this because if I make something melodic, uh, I won't be able to hear it. That said, if you want to run a percussion through there, you should feel free to do so. Let's dial this back up. And now we're going to do the oldest trick in the book. Open up the amount that the sample rate is being reduced and send it a clocked random step generator. So you can hear those buzzes or ring modulated notes being introduced. Rhythmically at the top of my sound there Some are more drastic than others See my starting point is still the full maximum sample rate so it can dial down like this much or dial down this much and nothing will really happen but I opened this up quite a way so it can get down into the chunky part of the sound if it wants to. Let's try it here. So a few of the tones are even replaced by clicks or gong-like melodic pitchy bits. But at least for myself I can still hear the same repetitive melody coming through. So that's pretty good, that's nice, I like it. Let's go back and add in the other one and basically do the same thing. Okay, so we're gonna open him up here. We're gonna turn this back on. We're gonna cut it down a bit. And we're gonna send him his halftime clock that he is clocked to. We got something pretty cool. Uh, I got power left over, so I'm gonna drop in some, you know, usual suspects. Oops, I did it too much. I made the sounds go away. I made the sounds go away. I'm kind of cheating my own system here. Let's. Put these here. Put these in the proper position. There we go. I'm just planning to add a simple little uh, beat behind everything. And to keep in the spirit of what we've been doing, I'm going to make a three input mixer. And I'm going to send the drums not to each their own digitizer, but to one master digitizer. So turning off the bits again, send that third guy to this input, wire the drums to here, I'm probably going to use, uh, well let's just turn this off so we can hear the drums first. going to use this channel, the second channel of event sequencer for the kick. There he is. Good. Sounds like
sounds like the same boring old drums you've heard before, I know that. But, uh... Once we get the sample reducer in there, it'll make it more interesting. Don't worry. Need a couple of these. I'm very close to the maximum uh, that I'm going to get in processing power. I'm going to try running normal clock to one and half clock to the other. some random signal. Uh, where's my... Yeah, there we go. Feed them some of this. So their patterns are always changing. This will be for the snare. I'm going to engage delta low so I don't get too many notes. sample reducer and see what we get. Not bad, but not great. That's kind of cool. Let's sample reduce that. Yeah, neat stuff. So the kick is still keeping us in a repetitive pattern, but the, the, the snare and a tom just play when they want to play. And they're being partially sample reduced as well. So what we get is the a little Game Boy composition here. It's neat. It's neat. I like it. So I think it's time to save it. band because we have the elements of a band here cool another neat one I can even feel uh, if I was putting this into the album I might go back and use the Jerome's idea trick so that I could switch from the looped and repetitive uh, octave melody to a random melody and back, but uh, I don't have, uh, I don't think I even have the processing power left to do that at 98%. But I might tweak it again. We'll see. We'll see. That's it. Game Boy Band. Uh, if you do have a, a digitizer, a bit reducer, uh, whatever your sample rate reducer, whatever it's called in your system. Uh, try it out. It's fun. It's interesting. It's such a huge part of the sound of this instrument, at least the way I use it. It doesn't have to be, but the way I use it, it sure as heck is. So I hope you'll find it useful too. This has been your boy, Father Moo. See you in church next time. <laughs>